conferência de CICAD. Uh, como anunciado, este, esta conferência será em inglês. Uh, espero que todos consigam entender. For this session on behavioral tracking, responsible gambling and player protection, we have 230 uh, attendees, as Lucia said, from different countries such as the United States, France, UK, Australia, India, Indonesia, Finland, Peru, Pakistan, Iraq, Santo Tomé Príncipe, and of course Portugal. We are very happy to welcome you all. This seminar is part of the goals of, of the working group dedicated to gaming and gambling. After exploring the state of the art in the research on this area and the prevention responses to this problem, we now turn our focus to risk reduction strategies in the gambling behavior. Doing this, we hope to continue to provide a comprehensive view of intervention in the gaming area, in addition to the treatment responses on which training normally has focused. It is a great privilege to have the two speakers that make uh, the, up this, this program. Professor Mark Griffiths, whom I hope that can join you, join us uh, soon, and Dr. Michael Hauer, uh, who dedicated much of their academic and professional life to the topic of behavioral tracking, developing studies and responses that clarify the processes associated with problematic gambling, and to strategies that contribute to a more responsible relationship with gambling. We hope that inputs that will result from this seminar may provide the professionals interested in this area a broader view of the problem, expanding perspectives and the range of possible answers. We have as moderator, Professor Pedro Hubert, a good friend of ours, psychologist, who has a PhD based on, on the research characterization and co comparison of offline and online pathological gamblers in Portugal, is the director of the Instituto de Apoio ao Jogador, a CICAD partner in the design and promotion of training. Uh, so, I cannot see uh, Professor Mark Griffiths yet, but we hope that he can join us. Uh, I, I would uh, welcome you once again. Thank you for being with us. Thanks to the organizers and I wish you a very fruitful session. Uh, Pedro, you have the floor, <laughs> please. Thank you, João. So, I have the screen now. I own the screen. And uh, thank you for, for the presentation and thank you for the CICAD for organizing this. Uh, welcome aboard to everybody uh, who is watching and listening. It's a good moment to practice our English. I will try to have the best accent as possible. And so, as we have some technical issues, um, we were supposed to start with Professor Mark Griffith, but we'll start with M Professor Mal Mark uh, Michael Hour. I hope you don't have to do both presentations, but uh, well, let's hope that technology will be solved. So, uh, just before presenting, uh, we'll keep we we keep the questions on the chat, or you can ask them after both presentation. And so, Michael Lauer is a statistician and psychologist. He studied in Vienna, Austria, and made his PhD with Professor Mark Griffiths at Nottingham Trent University. He published more than 40 peer-reviewed articles in the area of gambling about subjects like limit setting, personalized feedback, self-exclusion, and pop-up message. This academic background and his commercial experience of more than 15 years in the gambling industry led to the development of a playing tracking tool called Mentor, which is currently used by 30 different online gambling sites across the world. He is also a regular speaker at conferences and consults operators, regulators, and policymakers around the world. So uh, let's have a warm welcome to Michael, who will speak about the future and the present. The floor is yours and the screen. 
Hi, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to speak today. As many of you know, my, you know, mother tongue is German. So that's, you know, especially maybe for the Portuguese listeners, I will also try to really, you know, put everything into my proper English pronunciations here. And um, I will um, give a practical sort of, you know, practical uh, talk about player tracking, how it can be used, how it's used by operators. And I will jump a little bit between, you know, reality and fiction between, you know, academia uh, papers and how this then, you know, was, is, can be implemented by, by opera operators in reality how it's implemented right now and you know what in the future can be done and i really hope that you know mark griffith will be able to join i know many of you might be disappointed you know if uh, you wouldn't you know listen to him today as you took your time otherwise uh, we'll have to see you know if i have to do you know another you know, sort of more um, practical presentation that i of course didn't prepare but i hope you know really hope that, that he can join. Jeff Pedro, in terms of time, how long um, am I supposed to sort of present now until, you know, we would have made the switch over to the next presenter? Uh, I don't know about the, the, how long you would take to your presentation. I don't know, 20 minutes, maybe something like that. Yeah, I think that would be great. And then uh, if Mark is there, we'll start is or whether we will have some questions 20 minutes 25 minutes it's great okay no perfect. hurry can you just uh, confirm that you see my screen no yes. okay super all right so um, i will always jump you know between uh, presentation papers and like a video um, that i that i have prepared of course, everything, you know, that I use um, is available. I mean, all the papers are, of course, available. I can send the papers um, at, at your request um, or um, and, of course, also the presentation presentations that I'm going to use. So the first thing, you know, we sort of need to keep in mind for a very long time, uh, we've been talking about, you know, um, um, about um, informed choice, right? So informed choice is one of the, you know, keywords that has risen a long time ago, and it sort of um, refers to players' sort of, you know, uh, responsibility when it when it when it comes uh, when it comes to gambling to providing and as much information as possible and basically um, having the individual decide, okay, am I going to continue to gamble? Am I going to deposit now or not? But of course, for somebody to make an informed choice, it's important that they have an idea how much they are actually gambling. And that's a paper that uh, we published, uh, I think in 2000, um, what is it like uh, 17 in the Journal of Gambling Studies. And then this paper, what we did is we asked players how much they think they gambled. And then we compared their self-reported um, gambling losses. So their statements about how much they believe they lost with their actual gambling behavior, right? So we asked them, okay, how much do you think you lost during the last 30 days? And then we compared that self-reported loss number with the actual gambling. And what you see here in this chart here, you see the correlation between the self-reported losses and the actual losses. And we all know, or I mean, the majority of us, of course, have learned, you know, to some degree about uh, correlation, about scatter plots, about Pearson Spearman correlations at school or at uh, university. And we all know that if there was a correlation between two variables, dimensions, vectors, whatever you want to call it, the dots should all be on a straight line, correct? And if there was no correlation, then the dots would be scattered around, you know, in a random erratic matter. And what we see here is more like the latter case. So what we see is that, you know, that a lot of, uh, there's a large difference between self-reported losses and actual losses. So typically players underestimate their losses 
and they overestimate their winnings. And if we take a closer look at this scatter block plot, then we also see that the more they play, the larger these buyers becomes, right? So the more they play, the more, you know, the less aware, the less accurate their estimation of their own gambling is. So what's one learning from this study? And of course, intuitively, we all knew that before, but that was, you know, the first study to ever basically compared actual players losses um, with, you know, their self-estimated losses and not just from, you know, a sample of 50 individuals, but from, you know, thousands of online gamblers from Norsk Tipping, the Norwegian lottery. And in that case, we had available how much they actually lost. And we knew, of course, their own statements. So the, that sort of, to me, is really important, you know, finding because it shows that in order to promote, you know, informed choice, you know, um, self-awareness, it's important that an operator informs the individuals about their personal gambling losses, deposits, etc. And how can this be done, you know, in practicability? So I'll show you now an example how an operator does this with, I mean, in that case, our system, but it doesn't matter I mean, it could be done by the operator themselves with any other system. Basically, the, the goal is always the same, right? To inform somebody how much they gambled in order to, you know, make sure they have all the information available. So what you see here is, this is a Spanish um, online casino site. It's called Star Vegas. In this case, this video is in English so that we all, you know, understand. We have here up there the gambler's name. Juan Perez, we see that this player has a balance of 163 euros. And you know, like a typical online casino site, you know, up there you have your account. You cannot, player can always navigate to the account. They can choose from different games, etc., etc. So let me start this video. And now what we see is so the player navigates to the account, like Juan Perez navigates to the account, then goes to save the center. So that's what this operator calls. So this operator calls the the knowledge center, so the, the location where the individual can retrieve all the information about their gambling, they call it safety center. And that's of course always up to the operator uh, what, they, what they might call it. So player navigates to safety center. And what we see here is up comes basically information about these players, about my gambling behavior, right? So here the individual says, okay, that's, you know, that's how much I won, loss, that's how much, so in that case, the player, you know, um, can choose whether whether he or she uh, wants to uh, see how much they spent last seven days, 30 days, 90 days. Of course, you know, that's, you know, sort of might be specific to an operator, to a system they are, they are, they are using. Uh, but of, of course, it's important to provide information about, you know, very recent gambling and also over a long period of time, because especially wins and losses are subject to volatility. Somebody might win, you know, by chance, thousands of euros, dollars, whatever. Um, and in a, another time period, they might lose, right? So winning and losing is a random event. Of course, statistically over time, they will always uh, lose. But a single individual could sort of, of course, also ch generate a win. So we see here, that's basically information that the individual, you know, can retrieve about their, um, their own um, gambling, uh, gambling behavior in terms of winning, losing, um, depositing, uh, withdrawing, number of playing days, uh, playing duration. And then another um, aspect comes into play here. So what we also know from research is that normative feedback could have an impact. So what does normative feedback mean? It means that I sort of um, provide information to somebody about their, you know, behavior and, you know, comparable individualized behavior. That's not, you know, uh, limited to gambling. That could be referred to, let's say, you know, eating habits, to um, consumption of alcohol, to, you know, uh, sports, etc. So I could tell some, Pedro, okay, um, you are exercising, I don't know, uh, three hours a week and the average person, you know, in your age, gender, um, is exercising um, um, five hours a week. And then, it, of course, it's up to you, to the individual, to decide, okay, is this something that, 
sort of is in line with my expectations or should I, whatever, you know, um, sort of uh, change, change my habits. And we also know that often, you know, people um, in, uh, or be, uh, affected by behavioral addictions, they might sort of, sort of distort their perception of others and sort of um, um, believe, you know, okay, I gamble a lot, but everybody else gambles a lot. My friends gamble a lot, my whatever, my, fam my family gambles a lot or suppress, you know, this information. And there are number of uh, articles, research articles out there, um, also uh, papers that uh, I and Mark um, um, published in which we sort of tested the impact of normative feedback. So not only telling somebody that's what you do, but that's what you do and that's what others, you know, comparable individuals are doing. And that's what you, for example, see here, like specifically implemented um, by the operator, by this operator on, on that side. So here, a player um, sees, okay, how much sort of, you know, how on how many days did I gamble? So that's the blue bar, my gambling behavior, right? So, and the orange line is, you know, how, my, how, many, how, how many days did comparable other individuals gamble? And of course, if my bar, the blue bar is much larger, I know that I gamble more and more frequently than others, you know, comparable individuals. So if the blue bar, and the yellow bar would be, you know, equally sized, then I would gamble exactly as much as others are doing. But in that case, you know, I gamble of course more. So the normative feedback tells the individual who I'm Paris in that case, that he sort of gambles more in terms of duration, in terms of frequency, in terms of money withdrawn, money deposited um, than others. And of course, it's up to the individual to decide Okay, is this something you know that's in line with my expectations, or 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 not? And one um, psychological theory that comes into play here is um, called do we have it? Um, cognitive dissonance. And cognitive dissonance refers to a state when sort of your behavior is not in line with your expectations, right? So I mean, you, I mean, you you. Let's say, for example, okay, you will you feel sort of you know you spend too much time in front of the computer, you watch too much too much Netflix, um, you surf too much you know the internet, yeah, you are too much on Instagram, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And somehow you know you feel um, or you would like to you know do um, sort of reduce this behavior, and that sort of you know feeling of you know imbalance, that's something which you know. It's called a cognitive uh, co cognitive dissonance when your behavior is not in line with your expectations and feedback about somebody's gambling behavior and feedback about um, um, and additional um, introduction of normative feedback can ultimately lead to cognitive dissonance that's also a paper um, that we published and in that study um, that was also done with Norsch tipping we found that feedback about their gambling behavior and about normative feedback can lead to cognitive dissonance. And if you have cognitive dissonance, it can then ultimately lead or leads, it's more likely it leads to a um, behavioral reduction. And what did we do in that case? So what we did is that we presented players with their actual gambling behavior. And then we asked them, is this more than you expected? Or is this about as much as you expected or less than you expected? And of course, the ones who said, oh, phew, I mean, I, 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 that's much more than I expected. You know, I mean, you telling me I lost a thousand euros, that's much more than I expected. And we found that those individuals were also much more likely to reduce their gambling behavior subsequently. So what we did in that, in, in that study, we had uh, actual uh, player data, actual players. We told them about the gambling behavior and we then asked them, so we connected actual tracking data with self-reported information and when players said okay this is shocking this is more than i expected they subsequently also reduced their gambling behavior so we could show we showed that if you manage to trigger cognitive dissonance it's also likely that individuals will subsequently reduce their gambling behavior and that's of course something that operators can do if they um, if they um, inform players about their gambling behavior and of course additionally 
if they provide players with, uh, with a normative feedback. Of course, um, this can go, you know, further, even <clears throat> further, meaning that, um, you know, operators can um, make available different time periods for players to choose from, um, you know, I mean, it's of course flexible. I mean, we do it for the last seven to up to 180 days. And here uh, we also have basically real time information. That's of course could be a limitation, you know, of operators technical setup or the platforms they are using. But in this case, a player could even learn about how much did I gamble as of today? How much did I gamble, you know, since midnight? How much did I win lose? How much did I deposit? Um, in the very, I mean, very, very recently. So another um, a nice sort of, you know, interactive component um, is basically the actual implementation of the research that I uh, was talking about before. So in this case, players are, can, you know, voluntarily, of course, um, assess their own gambling behavior. So they can basically submit an estimation how much, you know, do I believe um, that I wagered in the last 30 days? How much do I believe I deposited? How much do I believe I have withdrawn? How long do I believe I gambled? So here the player basically submits an estimation how much he or she, how much they believe they gambled on you know, the online casino site. And then the system tells the player, okay, look, this is what you believe that you deposited. So you believe you deposited 25 euros during the last 30 days. So this is the blue bar. And in reality, you deposited 230 euros. So here, basically, we have the brutal truth, right, of self-assessment versus the actual gambling behavior. And again, you know, this is a component, something, um, I mean, some, sometimes that's also called like reality check by operators, where player, you know, can test the accuracy of uh, their own gambling behavior. And of course, operators can and some do connect such a self-assessment with, you know, certain incentives towards players or certain limitations. So a player's, you know, volume of gambling or, you know, the, 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 the monitoring sort of could focus on the individuals who have a very bad, you know, awareness of their own gambling. So imagine you have somebody who really sort of spends thousands and when they run this self-assessment, they basically have no idea how much they are gambling. So not surprisingly, an operator could sort of focus on that group of individuals who have a very bad idea of their own gambling compared to those who gamble a lot, but still, you know, they know how much they spend. just you know to give you a couple of uh, seconds to basically you know grasp um, all the information that's sort of provided here uh, to to an to a to a to an individual of course one you know aspect that is crucial when it comes to uh, behavioral addictions and of course all other addictions um, is um, um, uh, to tolerance right so that's one of the dsm5 criteria and it's one of the criteria that is relevant when it comes to um, diagnosing um, problematic gambling is needs to gamble with increasing amounts of money in order to achieve the desired excitement. So when it comes to that, basically it's important that of course on the tracking side that operators uh, monitor players over time and try to figure out, okay, is there like an increase in I know in deposits, is there an increase in gambling time? Uh, is there an increase in deposit frequency? Is there an increase in um, in in um, in in, gam in, ga in gambling days? And in terms of feedback to the players, what operators should do, and some do, and we do, that we inform, of course, the player not only about you know um, how much they gambled in totality during the last seven days 
30 days, etc. But we also make available basically day, you know, the, the sort of daily aggregates for a player to be able to see, okay, um, is there an increase in my behavior? Did I lately start to gamble more, right? So that's what a player would see here, how much they deposited on every day during the last 30 days. And then uh, we would also tell the player, okay, for example, there have no, no, not been any significant increases, or we would inform the player, look, we've observed, you know, that your depositing volume has increased over the last, whatever, you know, uh, 30, 30 days. And that refers specifically to, uh, to the criteria of tolerance, um, which means that somebody, you know, needs to gamble more and more in order to achieve the same level of satisfaction. However, we need to sort of also keep in mind that often in, especially in, um, in saturated markets uh, where online gambling, you know, has been around for, you know, a, lo a long time. I mean, um, you often see players who start to gamble with an operator register and they already start to gamble like on a, on a very high level. So you wouldn't see like the development of problematic gambling within one operator because they can jump between operators in that country or 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 outside so it's not basically the only sign that you need to spot it's one of the signs but it doesn't necessarily mean that every problem gambler basically shows this nice sort of increasing development of you know depositing gambling time, et cetera, et cetera. So it might be concealed to one operator because they sort of, you know, play with various operators, they get blocked by one operator, they move to another one, et cetera, et cetera. Nevertheless, it's important also from a player feedback point of view to uh, make available like, you know, uh, trend lines to players. So they get a feeling if their, you know, gambling behavior has sort of increased, um, increased lately. Just give you a couple of seconds to sort of, you know, um, take in everything that's shown here. Of course, it's up to the operator to decide, okay, which metrics they would show to the individual. But, um, right, game types, of course, so we can skip that one here. Um, jump to the next one. So one, you know, one, one area of research, you know, I'm particularly interested in and where we uh, published a number of studies is personalized feedback. So just go back to my papers here. Have you So it's one, you know, often or nowadays we talk about identifying problematic gambling. We talk about, you know, reduction of revenue that we generate from prob pro problematic gamblers. We talk about, you know, all the criteria that, you know, we should use in order to, um, to, 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 to monitor gambling behavior in order to detect, you know, which players might spend more then they, uh, they, they, they actually can, can afford which players, you know, show signs of impulsivity, of loss of control, et cetera, et cetera, in order to, you know, exclude them from marketing, to get in touch with them, to block them, whatever. But can we do, you know, uh, can, can we, are there actually, you know, prevention instruments? So can we do something before somebody, you know, shows those clear signs of problematic gambling and one of course aspect um, is you know um, information personalized information normative feedback everything that i that you know i've been uh, talking about and another thing is that we can go beyond that so we can go beyond numbers we can go you know um, we can go beyond the self-assessment and um, we can even you know inform players uh, personally, basically with text messages about their gambling behavior. And here we, you know, published a number of papers. And what did we do here? So we, 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 we identified, you know, behavior changes, for example, like um, increased deposit amounts, 
or um, increased uh, playing frequency, increased playing duration, so all sorts of things. And whenever a player, I mean, of course, again, from a real, real sort of online casino site or sports betting site showed, you know, a certain behavioral change, what did we do? We provided a message to the player, like a real text message. So a real text message that tells the player, okay, we have observed that lately your depositing frequency has increased, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the theory here, of course, was that like personalized messages um, that sort of are really addressing a certain behavior or behavioral change ultimately lead to, you know, um, um, gambling uh, reduction in gambling intensity or limit setting or, 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 or anything like that. So how can you imagine that? So you can imagine it the following way. So again, so we have the player here and the player has his or her safety center. And if the operator, the system, whatever they are using, <clears throat> um, identifies an extreme behavior, like an extreme loss or change in gambling behavior, or, you know, a lot of, you know, deposits in a very short period of time, then there is a message that sort of, you know, is pushed to the player and that could be pushed to the player or it could be something the player just has to collect, you know, or it could appear um, after the player is logged in. And that's, you know, sort of what I wanted to show you here, an example. So here the system, you know, lists all the messages that a player, you know, received um, over time and the messages are always addressing a certain type of behavior. So are you aware? how often you play, why not review your account activity or complete our self-assessment. So past research, you know, sort of points, sort of supports the notion that the messages should always, you know, um, address a certain type of behavior, should uh, provide like um, a way, uh, sort of tools for players to, you know, to, to gain a better understanding uh, of the gambling behavior or, or refer to like, you know, responsible gambling tools like limit setting or self-exclusion, in that case, self-assessment, et cetera, et cetera. And the, 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 the messages, you know, that we, that we researched, so we, we researched like, you know, non-confrontive, non uh, non-judgmental um, types, of, types of, 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 of messages. So some of you might then, you know, ask, or I'm sure that question, you know, will pop up. So how many players are reading those messages? I mean, do they even care? Do they navigate there to read the message? And that depends a lot how it's actually really implemented, integrated by an operator. So if a player has to navigate to a certain section of the site, just like I showed you here, a player has to go to his account, to safety center, to the message section, then the percent of messages read will be rather low, right? You know, maybe five, ten percent of the players might read the message. However, what you see here too on this side is that up there, this operator displays an envelope with a number, and that envelope basically um, displays whether there are unread messages. So messages that have been produced for this individual, Juan Perez, and have not been read yet. And if the player clicks on that envelope, he or she immediately jump into the message section. So they skip basically uh, three clicks. They just click, you know, on the message up there and they immediately sort of, you know, end up in the, in the message section and read the message. Because of course it makes sense also to track who reads the message. So if they click on it, we know they read the message and then, you know, we can sort of, you know, analyze the rest or we can delete the message, push it back and push, you know, uh, push new messages. So to answer the question that, you know, some of you might have regarding, do they care? Do they read the messages? It depends a lot how the message is, you know, integrated into, into, into a site. If, you know, players have to collect it with three, four clicks, very low sort of uh, percent of red messages. If they sort of just make one click and they are there, very sort of high percent of, of, of red, of red messages. And of course, I mean, I'm happy for you to browse through our paper. So we wrote several studies with respect to, um, to message reading. For example, this one that we did, I think, with Common, which is a, 
uh, online operator, which is mostly active, like in the Nordic, Sweden, etc. And again, here we found that you know players once they read the messages, um, reduce their gambling behavior, you know, um, significantly. Pedro, what do you think? How much time should I continue a little bit, or uh, maybe I don't know. Um, maybe three, four more minutes, and then we end up. We make some questions, and then we see what's going on with Mark. Okay, let's do that. Yeah. So, another you know um, area of research that uh, me and Mark uh, conducted in the past was with respect to pop-up messages. So what we did is um, we analyzed, you know, how pop-up messages influence subsequent behavior. So just like you see it here, you know, somebody is gambling um, and a pop-up comes up and, you know, informs the player, okay, you've gambled for so long, blah, 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 blah. So, and I wanna quickly navigate to the study here. Let me see if I do find it in time. Yeah, so here it is. So in that study, uh, an operator um, produced a pop-up message after players had gambled, wagered on a thousand, you know, slot machine, slot machine spins. So, and the pop-up appeared and it told players, okay, we have, you have now gambled, uh, you have wage, you have played a thousand slot machine games. Would you like to continue? or would you like to stop? And what we found is that out of the thousand, you know, uh, um, um, out of the thousands of players, basically just 0.67% actually stopped to gamble. So out of a thousand players, um, six or seven players stopped to gamble once the pop-up came up. The other 996 players continued to gamble. I mean, we of course don't know if maybe subsequently the pop-up had some sort of effect, but the immediate sort of, you know, impact of players um, continuing or stopping to gamble was pretty low, right? <clears throat> and then that was in 2012, I think. And then um, we had the opportunity to optimize the pop-up message. And what we did is, so we enhanced the pop-up message with all sorts of um, of uh, psychological, you know, components that um, that we could imagine. So what did we do? Let me see. <clears throat> so we incorporated normative feedback. So um, we said we told players, okay, um, only a few play, only a few people play more than a thousand slot games. Um, that was the normative feedback. Then we also incorporated, you know, um, common misbeliefs among gamblers the chance of winning doesn't increase if you do duration uh, with the duration of the session and we also um, um incorporated you know self-efficacy we told players taking a break often helps and you can choose the duration of the play break so the pop-up basically was enhanced so instead of just telling players you've played a thousand games would you like to continue or stop we told players only a few people play so many games the chance of winning doesn't increase and taking a break often helps um, and you can choose the duration of the plague, right? So at that point of time, that was sort of commonly, um, you know, commonly, um, com commonly thought of being basically um, helpful uh, when it comes to increasing, you know, awareness and inf inf informed choice. And we significantly improved the impact of the pop-up message, right? So you see here, basically the red, sort of the red line is the impact. That's the number of sessions that terminated at when the pop-up was displayed, you know, before uh, we enhanced the pop-up. And the blue line uh, represents the, the impact, the efficiency after we introduced. So we see, you know, the, the, the effect sort of more than doubled, but still out of a thousand players before the pop-up was enhanced, about six or seven stopped to play. And after we enhanced the pop-up, 13 or 14 stopped to play. So statistically, of course, highly significant, six to 14, right? 
but from a sort of, you know, practicability point of view, basically not really much of a difference. So I think, you know, I'll just, you know, stop here because um, that could sort of be a good transition to Mark's presentation if he was sort of in the core, which I fear he is not, right? <laughs> I see. Yeah. Uh, for the moment, uh, no news, I, I believe. But um, maybe we we could make some questions or yeah, let's do that. Yeah, comment. Uh, yeah, and I would like it. it I, I was listening to it. We have already two questions that I will. But uh, before I was, um, it's very interesting how we. I was remembering about intervention, uh, motivational interview, and how yeah. you can work on ambivalence of objective data and subjective uh, perspective and. We know how gambling and distorted thoughts and uh, cognitions and all the selective memory and perspective, selective perspective can be confronted with the uh, objective algorithms and data that you, you can show. And this ambivalence can be very useful. And if it at risk, it's a, it's a shame that the DSM uh, took the at risk or the, the level before um pathological or prob real yeah. problem dependency addiction because this could be a target very important target in your uh, search for popping message for, mm -hmm. for message popping out and tailored messaging um it's very interesting also the comparison that you made with the others and i read an article that we the reward system is more activated when you you really compare your wins with others so it's another very important tool that you can use but um i will share the questions that we have there are two two questions until the moment now we'll join both because they are in the same direction and one is in the identification of normative feedback relative to similar players how are similar players identified? Yeah. And the other one goes more or less in the same, is from Pedro Rodrigues, that uh, in my PhD thesis, I study the impact of message present in tobacco cases. And what I note was that cognitive processing of the information was depending of the stage of change. Thus, this input could also happen in gambling situation? Okay, the first question um, regarding comparable players. So what we use or the operators typically use is of course gender and age, because that's the information they have available and also the types of games they play if they are offering you know, a multitude of games. So if you have like, you know, slot machines, if you have roulette, casino games. I mean, also if you have like a lottery operator that has, you know, scratch cards and lottery products, etc. That's sort of, you know, what we use. Of course, we don't use like the involvement. So because, I mean, if you, if you, if you are, 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 you know, uh, comparing somebody to others, I mean, you don't take into account how much the others gamble or you gamble because that would sort of annihilate, you know, annihilate the approach. And I will touch base a little bit on the, on the types of games that, you know, um, we use to, to, to do the comparison when I, you know, um, sort of refer a little bit to game structural characteristics and the recent findings that we found there. And the second one, what was it like at the stage of change? Yeah, that, that's an interesting one because in this study that we did when we asked players, okay, we told them, okay, you lost a thousand euros. Do you believe this is more than you expected or about as much? And there we had one group, you know, of highly involved casino players. And they said, hey, phew, I'm fine with it. This is about as much as I expected. And that we suspected was the group of players who in the stages of change model, you know, are not yet 
<laughs> there and they basically either are not aware, you know, or they sort of, you know, suppress basically um, that they gamble more than they can actually afford to lose. So I believe that, of course, is is totally relevant in terms of the stages of change. But the idea, of course, is that, you know, the more frequently you provide information, the more easily it's acceptable that somebody who, you know, really plays, you know, out of sort of um, um, above their limits change their behavior because they are pushed, you know, into the stages of change because of the repetitive, you know, provision of information. Um, there's another question. Shall I read it from Sarah? Yes. Yeah. Do you manage to read it, sir? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Are the online casinos and other operators willing to implement these measures? Pop-up messages and others, is there the need for regulation in order to implement this? All right, yeah, so in recent years, and I would say it started uh, to shift as late as 2019, you know, um, operators um, became more compliant, you know, with the introduction of those um, instruments, responsible gambling tools. And of course, that's uh, related a lot to regulation. No? So we have now countries like uh, UK that is very specific or, you know, very demanding in terms of customer interaction, etc. And it all started more or less with player tracking, right? So the idea came up, you can identify blah, 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 you know, problematic gambling with, you know, um, behavioral markers. And then at the later point of view, also the idea, and that idea, you know, is still sort of growing, in my opinion, that operators can, you know, prevent that from happening in the first place if they intercept, you know, at an early stage with pop-ups and messages. And to answer your question, just take a look at countries which are not, you know, regulated um, in that way where regulation doesn't require that. And there, of course, those, you know, responsible gambling controls are also missing. Um, I have a, um, maybe a last question before we decide what to do next. Uh, well, we know that a small share of gamblers are responsible for a big amount of spending uh, in the, do you think, uh, you don't use so much the diagnostic criteria to, to know if it's a risk problem gambler or a problem gambler, a severe or moderate problem gambler. But do you think it's useful? You answer in a certain way, it's useful to these persons that spend a lot. We don't know if they are problem gamblers or not. But do you found in your data that um, it would be used? It's, it's some degree of efficacy in these persons. The, all the data tracking and the pop-up message and the personalized feedback. You mean if it works with this subgroup of players? Yeah. Yeah. But if you have some study about that, about this. Yeah, yeah, I mean, typically what you see is that, you know, for high, highly involved players, um, those things sort of, you know, work in general. I mean, of course, you never know in terms of stages of change where they're located, but, you know, one advantage of, you know, highly involved players is that they also are, you know, sort of picking everything that's available on the site, every button, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, it's very likely that they, you know, get in touch also with the, with the, uh, with the, uh, with the information that is provided. And one more, I think, piece of research, which, you know, should be mentioned here is, um, with respect to reaching out to high risk gamblers, right? So there's, um, on, I mean, more and more operators sort of, you know, actively get in touch with players based on, you know, on their social responsibility concepts. And there they generally achieve pretty good results if they follow a certain strategy. So typically what they do is they let the player know in advance, okay, this is operator XYZ, you know, we, you know, would like to talk about your sort of, you know, your spendings at our site. Can we call you? Uh, can you please, you know, let us know which of those time slots fits you best? And that research, I mean, which is, of course, very limited at the moment, but so far has shown that players are typically very compliant 
and happy, you know, that, that, that the operator actually takes the time, you know, uh, to, you know, and cares, you know, about their sort of, you know, about their, their involvement. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a last question. I know it goes a little out of our program, but it's very interesting one is that is this kind of tool could be used in other type of game like video games, like yeah, sure. for yeah. games in Fortnite and etc. Yeah, and online of course, games. you know. I mean, I mean, what we see, for example, on the on the iPhone, you know. I mean, you have. I mean, I don't know how many of you have the iPhone, but. Uh, here you have this um, activity report, right? So weekly they update and they tell you, okay, that's how much you spent on your phone last week. You know, so much you spent on Instagram, on Facebook, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's something that they basically um, they, they they do. And of course, all the gaming, video gaming uh, providers could do. But in my sort of, I mean, I'm not aware that they are doing it. That there also hasn't been a single research when. Um, actual player data, like time on device spent, you know, loot box spendings in play, whatever, you know, purchases have ever been, you know, analyzed. So we are not there in my opinion, but, you know, uh, maybe, you know, Mark would be, I think, more knowledgeable in that area because he published a lot of papers um, with respect to video gaming. Yeah, I think he has a paper where the title is something like the wheel is already invented. We are invented. <laughs> yeah, yeah. just have to adapt things mm. to the something like that. So I don't know if Lucy is there or if João have some um, something you could tell us about Mark to decide what we could do. There is something. Lucia. Pedro, o Mark. Estava só aqui a tentar resolver a situação do Marco, ele não está mesmo a conseguir entrar e estou aqui com o nosso departamento de informática a tentar ver se conseguem aqui desbloquear um pouco a situação para ver se ainda conseguimos que o Marco entrasse. Um, ok, uh, talvez tentar pelo, entrar pelo telemóvel. Ele não tem telemóvel. <risos> Ele faz tudo pelo, pelo computador, pelo Mac. Ok. Ele não está aqui. Você 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 entende algum português? Ele não está aqui. Well, I, I, well, I understood informática, so <laughs> that was, that I think was enough information to understand yeah. that he probably didn't make it, right? Yeah, they are, they are, we are try, just trying one more minute about uh, with the info uh, informat department of, well, I don't know how you say it in English, informatic of the computer department to see if they manage. Otherwise, uh, I don't know, because time is running. Uh, but. I mean, I could, whatever, you know, talk about two more things um, that, uh, that I sort of didn't yet uh, touch in more studies that, you know, I think could be interesting for the audience and then maybe um, have another short Q&A session and then wrap it up. What do you think? Um, if he doesn't just... manage to join. I'm just a messenger. <laughs> don't shoot the messenger, I don't know. Pedro, mas, mas acho que sim, podíamos aproveitar o, o tempo enquanto o Marco entra ou não entra para ter, para, para ter o Michael com mais alguma, algum aspecto que queria desenvolver. É, ok, Ma, um, Michael, if if you have some some more interesting things that you yeah, yeah, didn't yeah, have sure. enough time to sh to share or, or to to talk about it would be great yeah. yeah yeah i'll do that yeah so one study that was lately um, also uh, published um that sort of goes beyond you know pop up messaging so we know that 
you know, some, um, well, I mean, we have learned before that, you know, if you, if you, um, if you provide pop-up messages uh, to players, then theoretically, you know, it could be, or we have seen often that they, they would just, you know, carry on to, to play basically. So they, I mean, we don't know what's beyond, you know, the, the pop-up message, but on short term, basically, we didn't see an extreme effect in terms of terminating the session. So some operators, and of course, that's also something which is required by regulation, go beyond that. And they also, um, they block players after, you know, they show an extreme, uh, extreme sort of phase of gambling. And that's something that um, one, one, one operator that we work with, they're called skill, skill on, skill on net did. And what they did, what they do is basically, and still do to this day is if a player wait deposits 10 times on a day, um, in a consecutive matter, then they simply block the player for an hour. So we call it, you know, mandatory play break. That's the wrong paper here. Let me uh, bring it up because I saved the wrong one here. Google Scholar. Ah. Find all of the uh, reduce play break. That's the one. So just imagine somebody wagers uh, deposits 10 times on a day, and then the operator simply decides that this person will be blocked for an hour, right? That's, you know, that's the sort of, that's the, um, that's the decision they made. And that's, you know, the, the intervention. So it goes beyond pop up telling them, okay, you've deposited 10 times. I mean, you can, you know, limit your depositing frequency here or there, you do a regulated check. No, they basically blocked individual for an hour. And what you see here in this chart, that's, you know, the number of players on a daily basis that was in July last year from July 23rd to September 15, um, 2021. So we see it's about 50 players or something like that, around 50 players who on a daily basis deposit at least 10 times, right? So, and on August 20, what they did is they introduced the play break, right? So before they could deposit a million times, theoretically, just like, you know, it's possible with most operators that are not, you know, sort of limited in terms of the amount, the volume that a player can spend. And on August 20, they made the decision, okay, if this happens in real time, then we block that individual for an hour. Of course, you can, you know, pull up uh, this paper, no problem, and uh, read the entire study. And then we asked ourselves, what's happening, you know, after players, of, after this hour elapses? Because it's, of course, clear or naturally, they can't do anything for the hour, right? I mean, that's, you know, that's the basic goal here. But what's happening after the hour? So and our first sort of, you know, um, sort of uh, hypothesis we wanted to test is, um, do players, you know, less frequently sort of come back after the hour they has elapsed? Or do players, you know, simply come back after the hour, just like, you know, they did before and carry on gambling? And in this chart, we have the percent of players who go beyond 10 deposits. So before the, before the, the, this, uh, this mandatory play break was introduced, we see that out of the ones who deposit 10 times, 70, 80%, et cetera, go beyond the 10 deposits and deposit, I don't know, 11, 12, 20, I don't know what was the maximum frequency of deposits on the day during that period of time. And then once this, you know, really sort of cut off this mandatory sort of, you know, exclusion play break for an hour was introduced, we see that the percent of players who came back after the hour, because the hour they are dead, they are flatlined, they are blocked, went down to about 30%, right? So we see that the significant number of players, percentage of players really stopped to gamble with this operator. I mean, that's of course, you know, the limitation of the study for the remainder of the day, right? So we saw that play, the hour basically led a majority of the players, you know, to cease their gambling activity on that very day. And that was, you know, what we wanted to test. <clears throat>
because we did another study before with more clipping and there we tested the length of play breaks, right? So we tested a 90 second play break, a five minute play break and a 15 minute play break. And there with you know, a very similar study design, we learned that if you, know, you block somebody for 90 seconds or five minutes, basically 90%, 95% of the individuals come back once this mandatory play break has elapsed because most likely they just wait in front of the computer for 90 seconds or five minutes and teach, you know, carry on gambling. However, when the play break lasted 900 seconds, which is 15 minutes, you know, the percent of players who returned to play after the 15 minutes has elapsed increased significantly. So in this study, we learned that a play break should at least last for 15 minutes in a completely controlled experiment for the casino players. <clears throat> and in the other case that I was just talking about, uh, players sort of, they, 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 they really introduced, you know, a one hour play break that was sort of not up to us to decide, but of course we were happy to analyze the impact. So some of you might ask yourselves, okay, but I mean, maybe those, you know, who lost a lot before the system cut them off, because why do you deposit? You deposit because your balance is zero, right? You deposit the 10th time because you've lost so much on that day and then you just deposit again. And of course, some of them might have had huge losses before they were cut off. They might be totally angry, you know, pissed at the operator. And once the one hour, you know, um, elapses, they come back and they try to win back everything that they lost. So of course, we also tested that hypothesis and um, asking ourselves, okay, do players who lose a lot really come back and gamble even more? So do we actually create something that we call craving? Because one stat paper uh, that was published, you know, uh, a number of years ago at the researcher there, he hypothesized that play breaks actually are counterproductive, not hypothesized, but they did a study with, you know, self-reported study with players, not on a website, but asking them. And they came to the conclusion that the play break would be counterproductive because it would lead players to gamble even more after they were back allowed to gamble. And we also checked that with the real data that we had available from the players from that site, which the operator is called skill or net. And, in, and we couldn't find, you know, that basically chasing after losses or craving was built up. So you see here, basically, the amount lost, quantile of amount lost in the session before the mandatory play break. And if you see at those, you know, um, at, the, at the gray bars, that's the percent of players who deposited on the same day after the mandatory play break, you don't see a pattern, right? So you don't see that the losers, which are here on the left-hand side, basically were more frequently to come back and deposit than the winners. So there was no pattern with respect to, you know, losing, leading to more depositing um, after they can come back to the site and gamble again. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, Michael, because before you, you jump to another study, there's a great, great question from Bill Laytown that would be, uh, that has to be with all we have spoken here and uh, also with ethics. And if you could also explain a little for attendees what is affordability, but the question is what your view on over the affordability checks being yeah. discussed in the UK and maybe this is the future or not. And it has all to do with, with, with what we have been speaking. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, affordability. So there is a, you know, there a, a movement, you know, in, in terms of um, asking players for, you know, their available income or, you know, getting this information from third party providers. However, they get it, you know, I don't know, um, but obviously, I mean, you can purchase information about, you know, how much does Pedro earn or how much does he have available, how much, you know, how does Michael have available, et cetera, et cetera, and use this information to sort of customize, you know, maybe the limits that you impose on players, which I mean, in general, of course, is a pretty good, pretty good idea um, to do if those data are reliable. I mean, I can tell and some countries like the Nordics, I think this data are more reliable because this information is more easily accessible. In other areas, of course, um, like in the UK, this information is typically a statistical computation, right? Based on where you live, 
um, how old you are, um, you know, etc. So if you live near Buckingham Palace, your affordability will be higher compared to you living, I don't know, you know, in a less sort of, you know, favorable area. So what I think what we always have to keep in mind is that this information is not exact, you know, it's not like how much this person is available. It's a statistical number. And typically your operators cannot whitelist an individual based on this in the, informa the affordability information that they purchase. Another drawback, of course, here is that you would sort of, um, you know, I mean, you would sort of deny a rich person from having a gambling problem, right? So somebody like a rich football player in Premier League um, or anybody, you know, or it could, could have a gambling problem, but it might not really be a financial problem for them, but still they could have a gambling problem, right? Spent a lot of time with gambling, you know, that sort of takes away from their family. I mean, in generally they are maybe ADHD, you know, impulsive, compulsive, whatever, and they have other comorbidities and so on and so forth. But I think it's, you know, a piece of information that, you know, should be used if it's available and if it's um, sufficiently accurate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, or when this person starts to gamble in a platform or in a casino to say how much you, you would, it could spend, it's, it's very difficult to put in practice or to even the ethical issues of this situation exactly. can be. I mean, Sorry. that's something, you know, we try to sort of, that's always something that, you know, really um, has, you know, sort of kept me sort of thinking since I started to, you know, research in that area in 2008. It's like, what kind of, you know, behavioral aspects could you observe that are independent of actually money spent, you know? And I mean, sort of, you know, for me, the single most important behavioral metric is like frequent depositing depositing within sessions, you know? So what we see when we look at structural characteristics and we correlate self-reported problem gambling or self-exclusion with gambling behavior, we see that, you know, players who, I mean, who report that they are problem gamblers or, you know, in part self-exclude that, you know, they deposit often within session, they can sort of control when they stop to play. They always regularly play until their balance is near zero and, you know, show those kind of sort of impulsive, um, impulsive, um, in, impulsive uh, patterns. Um, I will just show one example here so that the audience has an idea what I'm talking about. So what you see here on this chart is, you know, an actual sort of, you know, data, data, uh, data, data sample that's from one player and one day that was on October 14th, 2020. And on the Y axis, you always see the balance. So how much money did they have on their gambling account, right? Online casino. And we see the person started to gamble at 525 in the morning and gambled until 1057. So roughly, I mean, more than five hours, five and a half hours. And during that time, the player played 6,000 games, which is possible, deposited 4,200 euros and lost that's like you know money one minus money the money money, money wage up four thousand three hundred euros real example and we also see that the player deposited eight times you see you know very often i mean uh, the, the 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 balance goes to zero and then the player deposits bing deposit 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 etc and ultimately ends up with zero uh, euros on the gambling account, right? So this is like a typical, I mean, extreme pattern, so to say, but that's sort of, you know, what singles seems to be the single most important metric, you know, they play, they, you know, deplete their account, they deposit again, of course, if they, if they, if they have, uh, if they have uh, resources available. And then the next slide here is the same player, the same session, but the metric on the Y axis is amount wagered per spin. And here we see that also the amount wagered per spin increased. So the risk taking per spin increased, right? Um, from 50 cents up to eight euros per spin. And those are, you know, the kinds of metrics that sort of, you know, should be, you know, observed. And also, of course, reflect, you know, 
to some degree in the DSM-5 uh, uh, metrics, but just like you said before, uh, Pedro, the latest sort of, you know, uh, sort of, you know, issue um, removed some of those things. But of course, chasing losses, you know, is, is one of those metrics that, you know, you could observe with uh, frequent depositing, um, increasing, you know, the wage up has been um, in order to detect, you know, those types of extreme behaviors. Yeah. Fabulous. <clears throat> All right. So, any more questions? Not for the moment. Very, very, very interesting. This is a world of possibilities and interacting variables. It's fabulous, fabulous. So, uh, what I can see in the chat is that Mark is really not able to come in. So, probably it will stay for another time. He's his presentation, but uh, um, yeah. because probably you have also your schedule for the day, so I don't know exactly <laughs> <laughs> what what we are going to do. And um, yes, Pedro, um, if I may step in, uh, I think it was very very interesting, as you said. There's a new world opening uh, around those issues. Uh, it's a it, it's a pity that uh, Mark could not uh, join us. Uh, maybe another time if he if we manage to 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 arrange the the, the link and to 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 try beforehand. Uh, but maybe Pedro could could uh, comment uh, make some make some final comments on, on this and uh, on the kind of tools that we can use in our reality. How, how far are we uh, of having this kind of uh, of tools to deal to deal with the with the with the gambling disorder? Uh, and maybe invite we have a couple of minutes uh, left uh, Maybe to invite our attendees to 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 ask more comments, uh, to ask more questions or comments, and then end the session. I think it's the it's really it's really a, a pity not to have Mark as as it was arranged, but uh, we'll have him another time. I hope. Thank you, Joe. And um, for a comment, uh, final comment, and just before checking if there is some late last questions, uh, I was I, I work basically uh, on the treatment area, and I was always trying to see which of this information we can use for the treatment because I believe addiction is always the 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 share of individual factor structural factor and uh, situational factor so uh, if when we could join as you were doing here all these variables and try to make this uh, risk reduction this uh, reducing damage how much important and how interesting we it would be to use all this information for treatment because Often we use structural variables in in treatment also not to go near places where you gamble, try to control the money, avoid this, avoid that. We also go into the to all these moment to structural and situational factors while we work on individual factors. So probably we could use a lot of this information to treatment. I will try. I don't know if you sort in this area or if you have something on this area it would be maybe very interesting my final comment would be thank you very much it was very very interesting and um, i see a last question thank you for from ever sure thank you for this presentation it was very interesting to learn about the innovation and the future of ways to help people with those problems the pandemic brought this reality to a light, especially with young people. Okay, it's not really a question, but maybe to end up, I, I 
did you notice the big difference for sure you noticed i have no single doubt um with the pandemics and all the, the what this brought in your area um i mean we we published even two you know research papers with respect to um online gambling sports betting and casino gambling and COVID. and of course it's very local you know like in terms of uh might be different in Portugal compared to Germany, compared to you know UK, compared to the to 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 the Nordics. And of course, it's not like a natural experiment. You have lots of other factors that you know impact whether players gambled more or less, or in or in a different way. So I wouldn't go as far as to make any conclusions that you know COVID led to more or less gambling. And um, where do you have, when you have some messaging, you have messaging saying maybe you could, of course, you have to be careful to, to, to focus on behavioral and not on judgment mm -hmm. or do you have some messaging suggesting treatment or to see some professional help or some helplines or? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's always then basically in cooperation with the operators. So the, most of them, you know, cooperate in the very country with organizations, and then you know they, of course, include those uh, contact points into some of the messages. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Because it's so much, it's like the self-excluded. It would be so important that, uh, for example, yeah, sure. in Portugal, for what I know, it's people that ask for self-exclusion, they are not. Uh, yeah. Uh, suggested to try and check this or ask just have a meeting with some helpline or with some yeah. professional or try to uh, that would be important also if there are no more uh questions uh i think i would thank you for the effort you have you had a big session today michael <laughs> thank you yeah very I, would much for I, would, you. I would take I will take a lunch break now. <laughs> <laughs> you have to drink a big bottle of water. And a nice lunch. And thank you very much for being Thanks here. Thank you. And um, see you soon, I hope. I don't know Thanks. if Roman says, let's say just thank something you. to finish. Just want to, to thank you, uh, to thank you, Michael, for your efforts, for, for being you. available to, to stay with us all, all this time and to, to take the opportunity to, to, to share the, some of your knowledge about those issues. Uh, as I said, well, it uh, would be great to have Mark with us, but uh, maybe another time. And I hope that you might be available as well for another yeah. session one of, these, one of these days or one of these years <laughs> to, okay. to come back to this. Uh, to these topics, uh, thank you for the quality of your of your uh, presentations. Uh, thanks to to you, who, uh, Pedro, as as well for being uh, acting as a moderator. Uh, I I quality moderator, and uh, thank you for that. Uh, I want to thank also to to Lucy for her efforts. Uh, to, to to have Mark with us and to all the attendees, we I don't know exactly how many do, do we have now, but uh, we had uh, a quite quite significant n number of participants. Eleven, uh, one hundred eleven at uh, at this stage. I think it it is it is good. It's uh, it's important to have so many people interested in in these topics. So. Thank you all. Have a good, good rest of of, of the week. Uh, and uh, this uh, is a topic on on which we need to have much more reflections and uh, share experiences uh, because it's quite new in our in our mandate. We are still uh, working to, on developing our knowledge uh, and uh, uh, it's very important to share the experiences of others that have more uh, more work done in, in this area. Thank you all for being with us. 
uh, and we'll meet in another video conference from SICA one of these days. Uh, thank you all, and we, I think we can close. Uh, Lucy, I don't know if you want to say something uh, else. Uh, we have recorded oh, this you. video conference, uh, haven't we? Yes, yeah. yes. So it will be available in our site in a couple of days. It will be so uh, anyone who wants to to see it again and uh, to take some doubts from what was said uh, as that opportunity. Uh, Lucia, that's all. It's so. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you Michael. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Good. Thanks. Uh, uh, Bye. For, for being with us. Bye. Thank you. Bye.